Welcome back once again. So this time around, uh, I did pick up recently a URT23. It's uh, basically, it's an RF-130, uh, I think is what they refer to it as, made by Harris. It's, uh, it comes with an RF-110 amplifier, RF-124 uh, power supply. This one has an RF-131 exciter, and then it also has a uh, antenna tuner and coupler. Uh, so, picked it up in Sacramento, um, brought it back down, and over the next few months, we'll be working to put it back on the air. So, let's take a little look at it, and then we'll give you some specs. Alright, as you can see here, here it is. I have it stacked up. It is meant to be rack mounted, uh, but I do not have a rack for it at this time. So, down here at the bottom, we have the RF-124 power supply. It requires 230 volts. It is a single phase power supply. Most of these, especially the ones that were used by the US Navy and the US Air Force, were three phase power supplies. Would have been a little bit shorter in height, probably a little bit lighter. Uh, this power supply here weighs about 200 pounds uh, and is capable at the high end of putting out about 2,250 volts at, I believe it's about 1.25 uh, amps. So for the final drivers. Uh, heavy beast, uh, that's why it's on the bottom. And then you've got the uh, RF-110 amplifier. It's uh, good for HF. Um, it's a very robust amplifier, as you can see. And we'll get some of the specs here in a minute so you can see the total uh, output. Above it here, you have the RF-131 exciter. Uh, this in the Navy would have been a uh, T827. Um, look these things up. It says it's about 1980s, early 80s, maybe mid 80s. Um, but as you can see, if you can see the controls over here, it's good for uh, upper and lower sideband. It does do independent sideband also. CW, uh, RAT, which uh, it requires AF or ASF, AS, AFSK, excuse me. Um, input, unlike the TA-27, this one does not have a loop input on it, so it does have to be driven by audio. Uh, this also came with a pre-selector, which really has nothing to do with the uh, transmitter side, but I'm gonna keep it and add it to uh, the receiver side. And then you have the RF-601A um, antenna tuner control. Uh, this would feed over and control this antenna tuner, which is good for the total output of the uh, the radio, which is a slightly over 1500 watts, I believe, when it's fully operational. Um, as you can see, uh, it's nitrogen filled to prevent arcing internally, and it actually still has nitrogen in it. A little over 10 pounds, which it says is the working pressure. Look at some specifications here. Now this is on the AN URT23B. This is what the Navy would have used. So like I said, up here, the T827 is not included on this model. This one has an RF-131. Uh, but what we're, what we're more interested in, of course, is the amplifier itself. Um, so let's uh, scroll on down to that. Um, so here's the amplifier. It provides two stages of linear amplification, up to 40 decibels of power gain in, to increase the drive level out of the T827, which, once again, we have a 131 up to a, a peak envelope power of one kilowatt. Uh, it may be continuously varied from 100 watts up to the full rated power with the front control panel. Now the interesting thing with this amplifier is when we get down to the characteristics, I don't know if it says it in here, but uh, the driving audio input or the driving input into this is uh, up to 150 milliwatts. That's it. Um, the amplifier drives itself from there on out so you can't really drive it with a normal um, what we would call normal ham radio nowadays because I, I as far as I know even my Kenwood that I have won't get down below 5 watts so you would overdrive it and probably uh, it would probably shut itself down because of the amount of power you're trying to push into it um, but this is a 2 to 29.99 megahertz uh, transmitter. Um, it's power consumption when you're operating on uh, 
220 single phase is roughly the same. So it's about five kilowatts transmitting and one kilowatt in standby. Um, that's due to the large uh, final tube that's in there. Now it does say it weighs about 352 pounds, which is probably about correct for this model uh, with that specific um, power supply. Um, but yes, so this is a hefty radio. Um, this isn't your local, you know, store-bought plastic. Uh, this was meant for, you know, use on ships, uh, Air Force bases, you know, down in silos. Meant to take the uh, vibrations and the movement and the weather you would have at sea. I did find this mil spec document. I was kind of looking around to see if I can find a brochure like I did for the, the amplifier. Uh, but this gives the general requirements for this antenna tuner. And uh, I think it's interesting to find out that uh, when you read, it says semiconductor devices. Semiconductor devices made of germanium shall not be used. <clears throat> As everybody knows, that works on this old equipment. Any of the stuff that was built in the 50s and early 60s, those germanium transistors <clears throat> were just not uh, not in it for the long haul. So... It's interesting that the Navy actually put that in there as a specification, or the DOD. Um, but this gives you the idea of what's going on with this antenna tuner. It specifically, was, not, was designed to be part of the ANURT transmitter. Um, the frequency range, of course, is 2 to 30. Uh, method of tuning, it shall be either automatically tuned or manually tuned. Automatic tuning occurs each time the primary power is applied by depressing the retune switch. Um, the logic circuits in the equipment then energize the servo controls which cycle the tuning elements until the impedance of the associated antenna is matched. This condition shall be achieved manually through the operation of the C3698 or the URA38 push button controls. Um, this is powered basically by the uh, amplifier itself. It can take 115 volts at 48 to 63 hertz or 115 volts 380 to 420 hertz if it's operating in that environment. It needs to provide electrical overload protection. Um, it should be capable of accepting emission types that produce the average peak power specified in 3.1.6.1. I went back to look and that's not there, but uh, in one of the other documents I read, it says uh, uh, 1,000 watts average 1500 watts uh, peak so that gives you the idea that this is built to last and they give other specifications for it in here too you know where it's supposed to be mounted uh, it needs to be capable of handling up to 45 pounds of uh, dry nitrogen uh, without leaking um, the specified failure rate up here shall be a thousand hours under any combination of the specified environments which, considering that these would have been transmitting a lot, um, that's actually not too bad if you consider the amount of power that it's consistently getting. So, and it goes through, um, you know, it shall be supplied by a 50 ohm coax cable. Um, it's supposed to come with a dummy load. The dummy load shall have sufficient power handling capability, so it will dissipate 1500 watts average RF power over the frequency range 2 to 30. Um, mechanical design and construction. So as you can see this gives you an idea of, of the requirements that are put on to um, manufacturers for military use hence the uh, costly uh, purchase price that most military stuff requires. Um, you know RF output insulator, specifications, time meter this does not require a time meter. Interesting enough, just to give you an idea, my RF110A amplifier that I got uh, with this uh, last load of stuff only has 26 hours on the filament on its uh, hour meter, so it was not used a whole lot. Uh, even specifies in here that you can't use uh, brushed motors for blowers. That's unacceptable. They must have a minimum lifespan of 5,000 hours. So. But yeah, uh, this gives you a very good idea of requirements put on manufacturers. Um, so next time you see the price of military gear, uh, understand that a lot of effort has to go into the construction of it to meet these specifications <clears throat> in order to provide equipment that will 
withstand the shock, the vibration, uh, if it's in the Navy, the, the environment that it's in outside. Um, oh, here it is right here, the RF power, power capability. The number was listed wrong. So the no normal power levels up to 1,000 watts, average power in 1,500 watts, PEP over the 2 to 30 megahertz frequency range. The coupler shall provide a minimum bandwidth of 25 kilohertz. The equipment shall be protected from damage due to a short or open circuit on the RF output connector with full power applied to the coupler. And it did say towards the top that this uh, was designed for a 15, 25, or 35 foot whip. There is a coupler uh, adapter, uh, RF625 I believe is what it's called, that allows you to hook this to a, uh, a long wire if need be just to give you an additional capacitance it needs to be able to tune that so and it also says that this uh, coupler is not to exceed 1.5 to 1 over the entire band uh, for SWR so uh, I will do this video probably in four or five parts maybe six parts as we go along so this is just the introductory video showing you the equipment what the equipment's about and then over the next few months, uh, we will uh, dive into this uh, transmitter and get it on the air. Uh, first thing I gotta start with is adding a uh, 230 volt plug in my garage. Luckily for me, my uh, electric box or my breaker box is right on the other side of the wall. So I will get that installed myself here probably in the next two weeks and then we will uh, uh, take this adventure together. So thanks for watching.